Good morning. So, welcome to the second day of the annual research conference of the CB. So, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to chair uh, this session. So, we'll start with uh, <coughs> Herman Gutierrez from New York uh, University, who will present a paper on how EU, EU markets have become more competitive than, than US markets. So, it's uh, some good news, at least for, for the European side. So, Herman. <coughs> Excellent. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, first off, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is joint work with Thomas Philippon. Uh, we're both at NYU. Um, let me start with a little bit of history. Um, the US, uh, in many ways, was a pioneer of free markets. Um, it, in 1890, it passed the Sherman Act, so it was sort of the first major antitrust law. Uh, and then in the 1970s, it went through a major deregulation wave, uh, along with, with the UK. Um, this meant that in the 1990s, the US was in many ways a clear leader uh, when it came to free markets. Um, and you know, this is shown in, in many discussions. For instance, Alessina and Jabatsi in the early 2000s um, said, if Europe is to arrest its decline, it needs to adopt something closer to the American free market model. Um, that's basically what we, what we want to do in this paper, is we want to ask, you know, did this happen? And in particular, we want to ask if this happened by contrasting the evolution of markets in the US versus Europe. Um, but, you know, before diving deep, let's, let's think about some examples uh, in some particular markets. So we can think about internet access, for example, um, and just compare prices and, and, and competition across regions. Um, this is difficult because, of course, it depends on sort of the size of uh, demographics, the concentration of population, uh, that affects sort of pricing. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the industry participants have done a lot of comparisons. Um, for instance, the, the Public Integrity Group uh, compared five cities in the U.S. to five French cities that were common uh, in as many dimensions as they could. Uh, and what they find is that consumers in France had a choice between seven providers on average, whereas in the US uh, they had at most two uh, and often just one. Um, so this tells us about uh, you know, consumer choice, the level of concentration. We can then look at prices uh, and you find very similar dynamics. So in an international comparison, a bunch of different countries, uh, what you find is that uh, European countries are doing fairly well, uh, at least when it comes to internet prices, uh, where consumers can get monthly uh, internet at monthly cost of $35. Uh, the US is essentially twice as much uh, at 70, uh, 66. Um, you can do the same for cell phone services. The OECD has similar indices. You find similar, similar results. Um, we can look at other markets, for instance, uh, the airlines market. Um, so this is a market in which uh, the concentration in the US increased very rapidly in recent years. Um, you know, it went from about seven major providers to just four. Uh, through a merger wave starting in 2008, uh, which means that today the concentration in the U.S. is, is in excess of 80%, um, whereas in the EU it's, it's less than 40%. Uh, you had also a lot of entry of low-cost providers. Um, again, looking at, at prices and profits, what you find is that profits in the U.S. are essentially twice as large as they are in Europe today. Um, now, these we think are interesting examples because these are two industries that you know, haven't undergone major technological changes in recent years, yet they have very different trends across the two regions. Um, nonetheless, we want to think about this more broadly, and in particular, if we compare across uh, all of the different industries, we find fairly similar results. Um, so what this graph shows you is the net profit rate, essentially operating surplus over sales uh, for the US and Europe. Um, so the solid green line is the US, and what you see is that they both start at about the same level uh, in 2000, but since then, the profit rate in the US has started to increase uh, from about 13% to 15%. Um, the trend in Europe is very different. Uh, so the raw series, the red one, is just the operating surplus over prof production. Um, and you see that that's been pretty stable in Europe. Now, you may think this is because of industry mix. Perhaps the US is more weighted in tech and profits have gone up in tech. Uh, but in fact, if we control for industries, you get the blue line. Uh, and if anything, the trend is even more decreasing in Europe compared to the US. Um, similarly, we can look at concentration uh, and we find a similar picture. So the solid line again shows you the the weighted average Herfindahl, uh, so compute Herfindahl for every industry in the US, and then take the weighted average across the industries, and you see that this has started to increase uh, around 2000. This is based on CompuStat. You can do the same with the census, find very similar results. Um, the red line and blue line are for Europe. Uh, now, you need to think about you know, what's the relevant market. Uh, we show two lines here. Um, you know, this is 
of course, fairly aggregated, uh, but the red line shows you treating every country as a single market and computing her fin for the industries within that country. Um, the blue line uh, treats the EU as a single market. And in reality, it's somewhere in between. Uh, you can think of sort of transitioning from the red line towards the blue line as the single market gets implemented. Um, nonetheless, the picture is, is very different, right? What you see is that concentration has declined at the country level. It's been relatively stable uh, in the aggregate, but certainly it has not increased, uh, not as much uh, as it increased in the US. Um, you know, there's some debate about, you know, are you using the right denominator if you use different sources? Uh, we've sort of shown in the paper a, a bunch of different robustness tests using the ECB's component data, using uh, CLEMS data sources, as well as the census for the US. And the picture is, is pretty consistent. Uh, not only that, it's pretty consistent across sectors. Um, so if you look at the different, different industries and sectors, you find something very similar. Um, so this is fairly surprising. Uh, if you ask someone in the 1980s or 1990s, what do you expect the evolution to be of competition across the two regions, you probably wouldn't have gotten the answer um, that you would expect Europe to become more competitive. Um, so what, what we try and do here is, is to sort of propose an explanation for this. Uh, and there's going to be two components uh, to this. There's going to be a theory. So we develop a model of political support um, to help us think through you know, what are the dynamics when, when a region establishes a supranational regulator for competition? And what the model is going to tell us is that the supranational regulator is going to be more independent and more pro-competition than the national ones that it's replacing. Um, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, the model is going to give us three key predictions, uh, which we're then going to test uh, in the data. Um, now, these are predictions about antitrust, about product market regulation. These are sort of different things to test. Um, so we're also going to look at, at prices. And in particular, we, we're going to try and get to consumer prices uh, by using PPP data and compare the evolution of markups uh, in the US and EU. Um, and last, uh, we'll conclude by discussing a little bit uh, implications for competition policy. So with that, uh, I don't have time to get into the details of the model. Um, but essentially, the model is a model of political support where politicians are going to design a regulator. And they're going to endow the regulator with a certain amount of independence. Um, the regulator will then enforce the rules, uh, depending on the independence it has. But it might be captured by one industry. Um, and when it's captured, it's going to allow higher profits. The politicians will get some benefits from that. Um, we can think about that as the politicians design a regulator for their particular country, um, or different countries getting together to design a supranational regulator. What the model tells us is that when they establish a supranational regulator, um, the politicians are going to choose a higher degree of independence. And the markets that result are going to be more competitive, meaning markups will be lower. We can, the, the intuition for this is essentially that you, know, you may worry um, about, you, know, you may benefit from your country or an industry capturing the regulator, but you worry more about the regulator being captured by the industry of a different country um, or the markets of a different country. Um, so, that tells us, you know, we think that this the supranational regulator is going to more, be more independent. Uh, we can learn a little bit more from the model. In particular, you know, we can think about what are going to be the benefits for the different countries that enter the supranational regulator. Um, and then also think about uh, endogenous lobbying. Um, so if we introduce lobbying into the model, uh, what, the, what the model tells us is that countries with more independent regulators, we should see less lobbying. Um, and this is interesting, not just because of the amount of lobbying itself, but because it, it introduces dynamics uh, to sort of the model. Right? The, we can think of politicians in the EU designing uh, the regulator in the 1990s, but then you know, the, the, the elasticity to lobbying or the amount of lobbying that happens may change over time. Uh, for instance, if globalization increases and the, the cost-benefit trade-off to lobbying changes. Um, so this introduces unintended consequences. If lobbying becomes more important because firms start to lobby more, the fact that you established a more independent regulator ex ante is going to mean that your markets are going to be more competitive relative to the US. And so this is what, what Tomá likes to call the European forward fumble. Um, so sort of by mis initially, you had some intended amount of independence and competition. But then if lobbying becomes more important, that becomes more important. Um, and so your markets become even more competitive than initially intended. So with that, uh, we're going to test the first two predictions. Um, this is about antitrust and regulation. Then we're going to take a step back and look at prices, as I mentioned, uh, and then come back to the last uh, proposition. Um, so first, for the first one, uh, it tells us that you know, when establishing the supranational regulator, it's going to be more, made more independent. Uh, we can test whether this is the case, um, both by looking at the laws and policies on the books, 
Um, there's been a lot of work in the law literature to compare this, so we're going to use a lot of these indicators. Uh, but then we can also, that doesn't necessarily mean that enforcement will be tougher, so we're also going to look at the amounts of enforcement and the trends in enforcement over time. Um, so what we show here is the indicators of uh, um, competition law and policy from Hilton and Deng. Um, so they've essentially ranked the laws and policies for 100 countries um, by type of uh, infringement, so dominance, restrictive trade, and merger. And what's interesting, what we show here is the red line is for European uh, national competition authorities, um, the green line is for Digicomp, uh, and then blue is for North America. Um, and what's interesting here is you can see that Digicomp is indeed tougher than European national competition agencies. And we don't show it here, but it's tougher than every single country. Um, according to this, this measure. Um, and interestingly, it's also tougher than the US. So this is sort of very consistent with the model. Now this is just one indicator. We can look at another indicator from the OECD. This is a competition law and policy indicators, and we find very similar results. Um, so in this case, a, a lower score means it's tougher regulator. Um, and you have four different dimensions, and you can see that Digicomp you know, scores the best possible score for scope of action, policy on anti-competitiveness, and probity of investigation. Um, now, the different European countries, you can see them along the line, you know, they have you know, reasonably good scores, but again, Digicomp is tougher than every single uh, country. Um, the US is the country all the way at the right, uh, where you can see it gets the best score on policy on anti-competitiveness, um, but substantially worse uh, for scope of action and probity of investigation. Um, now, these three really map to the model fairly well. This is sort of what are the capabilities that you endow the regulator um, to have. And the last one about advocacy, so this is how much the, the competition regulator can advocate for changes being made, say about product market regulation. This is not necessarily something that maps directly to the model, but nonetheless, you see that Digicomp uh, scores pretty good uh, and, and better than the US. Um, so these are two indicators about law and policy. Um, we can now move on to uh, the actual enforcement. Um, now, this is very difficult. Uh, of course, enforcement is highly endogenous. Uh, it also depends on the level of punishments that are made. Um, but you know, we're still going to sort of try and do the best uh, with what we can. Um, starting with merger, this is an area that, that there's been a lot of research. And here we can have a pretty reasonable comparison. Uh, in particular, um, Bergman et al. Um, asks the conceptually right question for what we're thinking about here. In particular, they gather granular data about particular mergers. Um, and then they ask the question of, if the EU were to examine the U.S.'s merger, what would be the predicted challenge rate? And what they find is that the predicted challenge rate would be 12 percentage points higher um, in the EU than in the U.S. Uh, this is based on cases before 2004. Right? So it does suggest that, indeed, the challenge rate for mergers is tougher in, in Europe. Um, and it is also consistent with you know, some of the discussion in the U.S. Uh, in particular, this is based on, on work from Tuoka, um, which shows you uh, what is the likelihood of a merger being challenged depending on the number of remaining competitors? So all the way at the top is if there's just going to be one remaining competitor. Um, in 1996, there was a nearly 100% chance of the merger being challenged. And over time, you see that that's been pretty consistent. Um, but if you, the more interesting part is, is sort of moving down a little bit uh, towards the middle. So that's when there were five, six, or more competitors remaining. In 1996, you would see challenge rates in those mergers, right? About half of those were, were challenged, but somewhere between 25% and a half. But over time, this has sort of declined substantially, so that today, basically, the FTC has stopped enforcing mergers that leave five or more competitors. So again, we sort of find a decline uh, in the US. Um, looking at uh, different types of enforcement, so abuse of dominant or monopolization, um, you find similar trends. Um, now, this is difficult. Uh, the data that's available um, varies, and the definitions at different agencies also vary. But what we've done here is we've tried to get the longest time series that we can um, with sort of whatever definition is available um, so that we can focus on, on trends rather than levels. Uh, in particular, here we show the number of cases brought forth by the DOJ. And we have data since 1970. And we're going to contrast that with the number of formal decisions issued by Digicomp on this type of cases. Um, now, formal decisions is tougher than cases, so only some cases get decided via formal decisions. So you can't quite compare the levels. But if you look at the trends, you know, they're very different. Um, the DOJ used to bring somewhere between you know, 5 and 15 cases in the 70s, then between 2 to 5 in, from the 80s to 2000, when sort of the Chicago school you know, played a bigger role. 
Uh, and since 2000, uh, the DOJ has brought a single uh, monopolization case. Um, by contrast, if you look at the formal decisions in the EU, those have remained fairly stable. Uh, and you, know, you can think of particular cases, in, and across a many different types of cases, uh, we see continuous uh, activity um, in the EU. So you, know, you can think of you know, dominant IT platforms with Google and Android recently, um, standard setting organizations with Samsung and Motorola, um, Amazon, and, and so, so on. Um, so we find a lot of activity in Europe. Um, so that's sort of what we have for antitrust in the paper with more detail about different types of cases. Um, but let's move on to the second prediction of the model, uh, in particular on you know, these cross-sectional effects. Um, and also, let's start thinking a little bit about regulation. This is a dimension that doesn't necessarily map to you know, the model directly, in the sense that you establish a regulator, um, and the regulation gets implemented by every country. Right? So in particular, the way it's worked in Europe is incorporation with European institutions, particular countries have to implement regulatory policies. Um, nonetheless, we find you know, similar results. Um, so to start, let's just make sure that uh, product market regulation actually predict profits. Um, so this shows you just you know, the relationship between product market regulation in 1998 and the profit rate in 1998. Um, and you see that the relationship is fairly strong. Um, again, we see that the US was sort of a leader in regulation, so it has the second best score um, next only to the UK. Uh, and most European countries are somewhere in the middle. Um, what happened since is, is pretty striking. Um, so you can see that here, every dot is a European country, um, and the line is the US. Um, so in 1998, you know, most European countries were score, scored worse than the US. Um, over time, they've improved a lot. Um, so this was an explicit goal of the Lisbon Agenda. Um, the Lisbon Agenda didn't succeed uh, in some dimensions, but in this case, it was very successful. Um, a lot of reforms were implemented. Um, so that today, most European countries score better than the US, uh, with just a few scoring a little bit worse. Um, there's a lot of work looking at the particular uh, um, reforms that were implemented to, to achieve this. Um, and they, they sort of show that this led to lower profits, this led to lower concentration and more competition um, in Europe. Um, now with this, we can then ask the question of, is it true that countries that had weaker institutions benefited more from delegating to European institutions. Um, now, to start, you know, we should acknowledge that part of what happened, part of this decline that you see in this graph, is just convergence globally as different countries adopted some of the US policies on regulation. Um, so across all countries, what this shows is the starting level of the product market regulation and then the change. Um, you know, that declined, and you see a strong sort of negative relationship for all of them, but the relationship is stronger for European countries. So there was a bigger decline in Europe in product market regulation than there was in the rest of the world. Um, and more interestingly, this decline was largely concentrated in countries that had weaker initial institutions. Um, so what we show here is, is measuring the quality of institutions in 1996 based on the World Bank's corruption control. Um, you can look at different indices like the government quality, uh, government effectiveness, uh, quality of government, and so on, and you find very similar results. Meaning countries that had weaker uh, institutions ex ante benefited more from sort of the European policies of the regulation, and they declined their product market regulation more. So you know, we talked about antitrust. Uh, we now talked about regulation. We see that there have been big changes on, on these policies. Um, has this actually affected the prices? Uh, and in particular here, we're interested in, in consumer welfare, so we want to think about the prices that consumers are paying when they go purchase products. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use PPP data to try and derive a markup um, and study the evolution of that markup um, of Europe relative to the US. We know from Balassa Samuelson that prices increase with wages. Right? We confirm that this relationship remains pretty strong today. Uh, in fact, it's sort of one-to-one -one of wages to prices. Given that, we can define a markup uh, in Europe, a given country I relative to the US. So that the markup is essentially the difference in the relative prices controlling for the relative wages. And think of this as the residual in a Balassa Samuelson regression, essentially. And we're going to think about how this residual change from 2000 onwards. Right? Um, so we compute this cumulative change in the markup uh, for a given country I from time 2000 up to a given point in time, and we compare that to the cumulative changes in concentration, again, relative to the US. So 
this is what it looks like in, in the time series. Um, so looking, aggregating sort of 10 of the major European economies. Um, the red line is the markup, uh, the green dotted line is concentration. Um, so as you can see, the markup was sort of relatively stable, starting in the mid-2000, it started to decline uh, in Europe relative to the US, and it declined by about 6%. This is a big decline if you think that this is, this is markup. This is telling us that you know, prices controlling for wages declined by about 6% in Europe relative to the US. And if you look at concentration, this is sort of very consistent. There's, of course, a lag, as you would expect. Um, but as concentration declined in European countries, we see that the markup uh, also declined relative to the US. Now, this is just the time series. We can do the same in the cross-section. Um, so in particular, you know, the first column uses the, the cumulative change in HHI. Um, column three looks at the concentration ratio. And we find that this relationship is, is indeed pretty strong. Um, now, this is different data, but nonetheless, we can add a country fixed effect, and we can add a year fixed effect, so that essentially we're identifying on the differences in the declines in concentration across European countries, and we find that the relationship remains quite strong. Um, looking at the last column, this sort of tells us that you know, if the concentration ratio declines by 10% relative to the US, uh, in, in reality it declined about 7%, um, the markup is going to decline by about 7%. Um, so it's pretty consistent. It's a robust relationship across the different countries. Um, and we can also look at the evolution of the markups for particular countries. Um, so you know, this is somewhat interesting. The country all the way at the top is Italy. Um, this is a country where we know productivity growth has been relatively weak. Um, and you, know, you don't see a substantial improvement or any improvement in the markup at all. Um, moving down, you see uh, Germany and France uh, almost at the bottom. Um, Spain as well. So these are countries in which we see a, a bigger decline in prices um, relative to the US. So this is at the country level. We're working to expand it to, to the sort of industry and, and more granular levels. Um, so we talked about antitrust. We talked about regulation and prices. Um, the last prediction of the model was that we should expect more lobbying in the US if institutions are less independent. Um, so we're going to look at that next. Um, and to give a little bit of background, you know, there is a lot of discussion in, in the US. Um, you know, this comes from a, a quote or a letter that Jerry Polis wrote to the FTC when they started the investigation of Google. Um, now, Google is a case that the FTC considered and decided not to bring, um, whereas you know, recently Digicomp ruled on, on it. Um, the letter basically says, you know, I believe that application of antitrust against Google would be a, a misguided step that could lead to congressional action uh, reducing the ability of the FTC to you know, do its job. And this is not an isolated incident. You know, just for Google, there were 13 congressmen who sent letters to the FTC. Um, so you know, somewhat common, it's suggestive that there is potential for, for you know, some effect uh, of lobbying. Um, so with that, uh, we can actually compare the, the, the expenditures. Um, so this shows you what are the total lobbying expenditures uh, to the federal uh, institutions in the US compared to lobbying in the EU, to EU, EU institutions. Um, so as you can see, uh, lobbying in the US is about three times higher as it is in Europe. Uh, and interestingly, there's a much larger percentage of lobbying that is done by business in the US relative to Europe. These are aggregates. Uh, perhaps more interestingly, if you then match this to firm level data, the elasticities of lobbying to size are about 0.15 in Europe compared to 0.62 in the US. So you see that the larger firms in, in the US lobby a lot more, and they increase the lobby for lobbying much faster. Um, we can then look at outcomes. Um, there's been, again, work in political science looking at this um, that basically shows that in the US, there's a much higher likelihood of corporations succeeding in their goals, um, both in absolute terms and relative to institutions that sort of fight for the public good. So 89% of corporations succeeded in their goals compared to 40% or 37% of foundations and citizen groups. In Europe, you still see some success of lobbying firms, um, but then citizen groups and foundations have about the same rate of success um, as corporations. Um, the explanation that's been put forth, uh, you know, at least by, by Mahoney, was um, that this was driven by campaign contributions. So we can look at campaign contributions next. And you know, if we think that the differences in lobbying are striking, uh, this, is, this is even more. Um, so this shows you total campaign expenditures for federal elections as a percentage point of GDP. Um, and what you see is that 
campaign expenditures in the US are anywhere from about 20, three to 20%, time, 20 times higher um, than in European countries, right? And here we just have a sample um, of countries for which we could get data. Um, so again, consistent with the model, we're seeing a lot more lobbying, a lot more um, campaign expenditures in the US relative to Europe. Um, now, we've talked a lot about regulatory activity so far. Um, could it be that there's an overreach? Is it that regulators are doing too much? Um, and essentially, you know, this is the whole point of the Chicago School, they're reducing the, the productivity. Um, so what we do to test this is, is look at the, the industries in which cases were held. Um, so this is an industry panel. Um, and we look at what is the effect of enforcement activity in the EU on first concentration and profit rates. Uh, and as you can see, you know, indeed more cases lead to lower concentration, uh, lower um, profit rates, but they don't seem to have a negative effect on productivity. Um, in fact, you know, this is noisy and it depends on the specification that you use, but if anything, um, the coefficient is positive. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we have the discussion, Shebnem Kalemni Oskam from the University of Maryland. So Shebnem. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to discuss this paper. Um, it's a very interesting paper, as you just listened. And if I can have my slides, I can start. Slides. Um, all right. So let me uh, start by a little bit talking about the the state of the literature. Uh, because if you are not working directly in this literature, actually, it can get uh, quite confusing with uh, two sets of, uh, you know, kind of researchers looking at two sets of facts that are related, but at the same time also distinct, which are facts on markups and facts on concentration. So the literature, okay, uh, my title got cut off, so that's not good because I have a lot of stuff there. Is there a way we can adjust this for the title? Yeah, okay. Let's just do this. So literature says concentration increase in the US. So this, this is actually a very, very large literature focusing on the US. In fact, the, the first uh, paper that started uh, focusing other countries is uh, by uh, Herman and Thomas. Uh, so that literature, European literature, is still at infancy. And the literature in the US uh, puts two interpretation on this, the, the higher concentration in the US. So the first interpretation is a more uh, you know, less benign, kind of more uh, pessimistic, which is about market power. This interpretation goes uh, in a way that these two sets of facts, facts on concentration and facts on markups, go together. So concentration, sectoral concentration increase in U.S., but markups also increase in U.S. In fact, uh, Herman and Thomas, they have another paper. The uh, first paper on this was by Delocre and Eckhout. You know, these guys says, you know, this is alarming because, of course, this is going to imply low investment, low productivity, so we don't like it, right? So this is uh, like lower competition. Now, there is a more benign, uh, more optimist interpretation of these facts in the U.S., and that's the technology interpretation. So the work by Alter et al. and Eberly and co-author says, well, look, the way the technology evolves actually allows some really large firms, some superstar firms, get a higher share of the market. Okay? And that uh, you know, combined with the intangible capital these firms use, you know, Amazon, Google, uh, of the world, it makes it hard to decide what is going on with investment. If anything, this is this can lead to higher productivity and higher investment. So these are very, very different interpretations. I mean, obviously, super different policy implications. So it's important to understand uh, what is going on. Now, here comes this paper, and this paper says, well, can we learn more about these uh, issues if you look at Europe? They argue forcefully, actually, now uh, in a series of work, uh, this paper and the previous paper, it can't be the technology interpretation. Why? Because clearly European countries and US, these are both at the technological frontier, you know, how different technology can be uh, among these countries, but maybe there is an institutional explanation to these differences uh, in concentration increasing in the US and decreasing in the EU. So the authors convincingly argue that it can't be technology, but the differences in institutions 
systems in US and Europe uh, maybe have a bite to explain these uh, differences in concentration, and that is about antitrust law enforcement. So they are going to argue that the way US and the European uh, uh, Union enforces antitrust law can explain the differences in concentration. They provide a model and they provide evidence supporting their argument. Okay, so my general impression is this is an excellent paper. It is uh, very provocative. I think it's super useful to look at other countries and get out of the US if you want to know more about this issue. And this paper really makes uh, you think outside the box. Uh, They're still working on it, so I think there are a lot to do to strengthen the interpretation. So my comments is going to be exactly on that. So I'm not going to argue with their general conclusion. I really like a lot this line of work. I think if they you know, take care of some measurement issues, and a little bit think um, more on how to link the model and the evidence, I think that's going to de really help their uh, interpretation and uh, they can further support their argument. Let me start with the measurement issues. So the first measurement issue is about definition of the market. So how uh, you know, uh, people do the concentration. Let me talk about concentration. I'm going to mention markups a little bit, but this paper is really about concentration. And the way you look at concentration and marks up, markups are very different. You saw from Tom, uh, the, the Herman's presentation, they start looking at markups too, but let me just focus on concentration right now. That's may, their main thing. Concentration is measured by a Herfindahl index, and that is about, you know, you go and take the market shares of the firms and then you score it. And of course, the first question here in terms of the measurement is how you define relevant market. You ask the IO economists, they will tell you, well, you know, the market definition should be based on the consumption substitutability. You want to have a high cross press elasticity of demand. Uh, this is exactly why IO people go and look at very narrowly defined industries. Clearly, in a context of a, a more macro study, this is hard. So, you know, the authors look at uh, the sectors, SIC sectors. You know, that might be a little tricky because if you talk to antitrust practitioners, SIC-based industries may not be the relevant market. So you might have low concentration based on SIC codes, industries, but then there might still have monopolies uh, lurking inside that industry uh, within a you know, smaller market. So it's, it's important to uh, link a little bit of what do, you mean with, what do we mean with the market to what antitrust practitioners mean with the market, and they, they, they may not coincide. Um, in European cases, it's important because, as you all know, uh, when we think about single European countries versus EU as a single market, there is going to be a lot of national interest, political factors, certain sectors are going to be defined under national interest, so there's going to be a lot of issues uh, that relates to role of global competition and foreign ownership, how uh, you know, Europe is going to be very sensitive uh, in terms of mergers and acquisitions, especially cross-border mergers and acquisitions when it comes to certain sectors. So, and I'm going to talk more about that. All this you know, makes us a little bit uh, maybe cautious in terms of uh, putting that arrow there, direct link from observing a low concentration at the SIC industry level to you know, what you want to go, which is European firms are competing more. You know, that's really what antitrust is about. You know, the message you want to give in this paper is European firms are competing more for customers than the, than the American firms. Okay. But they can definitely uh, improve on that because now they are going more granular. This is something very hard to do with the sector level data. They are, you know, you can do more with the firm level data. You can, you know, define the markets, you know, checking with the antitrust definition and all that. So clearly, and that's exactly the, the, the way the authors are now uh, going forward. The second measurement issue is about firm selection. This is more important when you start doing markups. I'm not going to say much about this because, as you see, they just started working on prices and markups, and in the, in the, in the paper, they didn't have much, but this is, again, the direction now the authors are taking. What I'm going to show here is the markup calculation from two different papers. So the first one, the one with the red lines, is from Delocre and Acau, their global market power paper. So you see, like, you know, Europe, North America, South America, you know, all these, like, super high markups. The numbers you see there is, like, markups are increasing, like, 60%, 70%. It's, like, it's gigantic. I mean, this is, like, you know, uh, really, really big increases. They use listed firms. All those red lines, and you can just focus on the first little window saying Europe there, that's an increase of uh, over 60%. That is based on listed firms. This markup calculation is based on a production function estimation. Uh, Herman and Thomas is not doing it this way, but this is still important because uh, 
a huge literature, including the IO economists, do it this way. So, uh, and when you do it this way and you use only listed firms, you get these gigantic numbers. Now, the bottom figure with the blue line, that's only Europe, that's an order of magnitude smaller. So you go from an 80% markup increase in Europe to just an 8% markup increase. Actually, not even 8, it's 7. That's from a paper by Diaz, Fan, and Villegas Sanchez that's using uh, all firms' data in Europe from Amadeus Orbis, which is actually the data set also now uh, Herman and uh, Thomas uh, is using. So I, I would be very interested to see this also for concentration. Like, you know, if, if concentration will also will change a lot if, if we uh, do these things. But this is just to say that, uh, this is not to say that I'm not believing their first markup calculation that show prices are also decreasing in Europe. I'm just like showing this so that this is very sensitive to what type of firms you are using. The, the, the minute you move from sector data to firm data, it's going to be important to uh, look at the firm selection in your sample. Okay, so in terms of my comments uh, uh, in uh, linking the model and evidence, so they have a super nice, elegant uh, political economy model. The key in the model is these institutional differences between the European Union and the United States. So these two, um, you know, countries, continents, US and the Europe, they start with different initial conditions. US starts better, but over time, you know, US deteriorates and European Union improves. It's, it's, it's shown very nicely and, you know, it's uh, backed up with this very nice uh, uh, lobbying and political capture in the model. In the data, you know, a lot of these things shown in static differences. Remember the, the uh, original figures uh, Herman showed you, like which one is higher, which one is lower. Later uh, on the uh, antitrust cases and enforcement, uh, Herman showed time series data, but I think we should be doing more with the time series data here because it's really about you know, deterioration in the US and an improvement in the Europe. And of course, this is very hard, as uh, Herman said, because different indicators can give you different stories. I'm just going to plot three government governance indicators from World Bank, just very standard measures. That shows you exactly what uh, Herman talking about in terms of initial differences, but then the over time deterioration is not that different. So that's why it is important which indicator you are looking at. This is government effectiveness. Uh, I have it highlighted what it captures. It is about independence from political pressures, so related to their political capture idea. And the EU is the red line, the US is the blue line, uh, and there is deterioration you know, in, in both of them over time. You know, deterioration is not that different. If you look at regulatory quality, this is about uh, you know, policies and regulations that helps the private sector development. Again, uh, there is you know, left on the level differences, and EU is doing much better here because EU is you know, nothing going on over time, but there's deterioration in regulatory quality in the US, so that goes more with their story, but then we also don't see any improvement in the EU. And the third one, the corruption, this is actually one of the things they do look in, in a static environment. Here it is dynamic, and as you see in the yellow highlight, this is really about capturing of the state by elites and private interests. So this is really the idea they are after, and here there is definitely a deterioration in the US, but there is also a deterioration in the Europe, I mean, not that big a difference. I believe, you know, there is some more work to do here in terms of maybe certain uh, indicators linked to their model uh, better, and then, you know, maybe we can look at both static and dynamic differences in those indicators. Another important issue in this model evidence link is uh, this, this trust, right? A key uh, assumption in the model is, you know, French uh, doesn't trust German, they trust more to ECB, okay? So like the idea is like I trust the uh, pan-European institution more than I trust my uh, fellow Europeans. This is actually a really neat idea, and this relationship uh, can be static, can be varying over time, can be varying by uh, geographically, by countries and regions, so there's a lot actually they can do with this relationship, and it's, it's super important uh, for their uh, model and the argument. In fact, there is actually a literature that shows a very strong correlation between trust and economic integration, both financial integration and trade in integration. Uh, people like uh, Luigi Gizio work a lot on this. I have a paper on this that shows how, you know, the laws on the paper that allows you easier cross-border mergers and acquisitions, say the laws make it easier for German firms buy out French firms, but you don't do it because you don't trust uh, you know, uh, Germans. So that's actually really, really important. 
So to kind of go back to the, to the work I did in 2007, uh, actually for an ECB conference, uh, and then you know, kind of re-look at that data, this is plotting exactly that relationship. So on the x-axis, I have you know, Germans trusting more or less to French. So the idea is you trust uh, more, more or less to other nations. That's the x-axis. And the y-axis is your confidence and trust in EU-wide institutions. And that's, there's a negative relationship. It's not very strong, uh, but there's a negative relationship that says, I trust less to other countries. I trust more to EU-wide institutions. I think this can be shown much stronger if uh, the authors use uh, European World Value Survey. I use data from World Value Survey that's more restricted on the coverage of uh, European regions, but there's, there's, there seems to be something there. But again, of course, you also want to show it over time, because remember, their model is about there are these differences between uh, US and Europe, and then these differences intensify the other way in the favor of Europe over time. So if you Look at this over time. I'm going to do this in maps so you can see visually. So what you want to see here, this is kind of European regions and countries, and darker colors is more trust. So this is going to show 2005, and then when I click, I'm going to go to a uh, you know, future year. The idea is if the color gets darker, there is more trust to others. So French is now trusting more to Germans. If the colors get lighter, there is less trust, okay? And obviously, you see there is a lot of variation within Europe across European regions and countries. So this is 2005 survey. Then the colors get lighter in 2010. That means now European nations trust even less to each other. OK, so that goes their way. What about trust in the EU? Because you want the other one goes to go darker. So you want I trust less and less. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, as a you know, German, well, I'm not German, but for the sake of argument, as a German, I trust less and less to French, but I trust more and more to ECB, European Union, and all these pan-European institutions. And that seems this also gets lighter, okay? So this is the trust in the EU institutions in 2005 and 2010. Of course, there is the crisis in the middle of this sample, you know, so this can be related to that, but this is something important, I think, uh, to pin down because this is, this is central to their model. Okay, and my final point is on the interpretation. So it is very important for the authors that it is political capture, right? So the idea is, you know, there's a lot of lobbying in the US, you know, uh, this, you know, politicians capture, regulators captured by the elite, private interests, and that's why, you know, US is going down, and in Europe, this doesn't happen. Well, this is actually extremely hard, and Herman already said that. This is not very straightforward, because think about it. You want to link antitrust enforcement you know, over time to political capture and to concentration in data. So in the terms of the example Herman is giving you, that letter uh, written to the congressman, right, I mean, in for Google, so you want Google paying those people, and then that links to the concentration is exactly Google operates. So it's just, it's not a very straightforward uh, link to make with the data they have. You definitely need to go to more granular data, and you really have to establish robust evidence on that. Lobbying is a very good idea uh, to look at in terms of establishing this relationship, and they do actually look at that. The, the model is going to show you that larger firms lobby more and get larger. Very nice, but also we know that from the literature in the US, productive firms also lobby more, and we know from the firm dynamics literature, productive firms, of course, get larger. So it's not just that the causality goes both ways, you know, there's also this omitted variable bias here in the relationship between size, market concentration, and uh, lobbying. So one idea here they can do, and this data do exist for US, I'm not sure if it exists for Europe, but this uh, geographical dimension, cross-state lobbying, cross-state concentration, so it's a state sector variation that maybe you can do more uh, in testing these uh, lobbying. I mean, endogeneity is still going to be hard, but at least you are going to have more variation. Now, the interpretation also gets tricky when you think about how DGCOMP operates relative to DOJ, Department of Justice, and FTC, Federal Trade Commission. Well, you know, because when you look at the, the law on the paper, it's not that different. But in practice, it is possible that the GCOM defines the market wider. Maybe they are more speculative, like the Google case, again, an example, to block these mergers, because they don't have to prove their case in court as uh, tightly as the OJ and uh, FTC. In fact, when you talk to antitrust practitioners, IO people, that's the first thing they think. Is this called political capture? Maybe it is political capture, but clearly more work needed to link that to the political capture. 
And as I mentioned before, in the European case, this uh, cross-border merger is going to have a very important role because uh, Europeans, of course, famous in blocking these cross-border mergers and not because it is tough for antitrust enforcement, but because of this political national interest. So I'm actually going to show you some data on this. So this is from a recent work uh, I'm working with uh, Carolina Villagas Sanchez, uh, where we look at the concentration measures. So very similar actually to uh, Herman and uh, Thomas using a Herfindahl index. This is Herfindahl index based on top 50 firms market shares. So just, you know, there are a lot of sectors here and there's variation in sectors and we, we plot two years, what happens to concentration in 99 and 2012. The point I'm trying to make, if you look at tobacco, just the first uh, item, you see that the light blue line is the, you know, Herfindahl based on top 50 firms market shares that says, look, 80% of this market is, goes to the top 50 firms, that's the light blue line, but the dark blue line are the foreigners but most of that is the foreigners. So the sectors where foreigners have a big market share are actually the ones that have the bigger drop in concentration. You can do it more systematically, where you look at the foreign concentration in the sectors in the initial year, and then look at the drop in the concentration, and it's going to be, and this is Europe from 1999 to 2012, the higher the foreigners' market share in a sector, the bigger the drop in concentration in that sector. Again, this is now suggestive. It has to be, of course, uh, done uh, much better uh, with many robustness, but at least uh, there might be something there. Well, you might think, well, maybe we should look at FTI restrictiveness because instead of like a, you know, endogenous outcome like foreign concentration, maybe we should look at the laws on the paper, which is what they are doing with product market regulation. So this figure plots you the concentration, Herfindahl index, against the FTI restrictiveness by sector. So there is a weak negative relationship that says, you know, the more uh, the sector restricts foreigners coming to that sector, the lower the uh, uh, concentration in that sector, but this is very weak, it's not significant. When you look at the change again, change from 99 to 2012, kind of during their sample period, it is indeed the case that if you restrict a sector more for foreign entry, for FDI, that is the sector that is going to have a bigger drop uh, in concentration. Just to summarize, I believe this is a very elegant, very thought-provoking paper. Um, you know, they are definitely onto something, and uh, I do uh, believe there is definitely uh, meat in the story relates to the uh, regulatory environment and institutional differences uh, in U.S. and the European Union, but I believe we need more evidence to connect these three, right? You want to connect low concentration in Europe to low market power, and that should be due to better antitrust enforcement, uh, both over time and also uh, in cross-section, and I believe there is actually an important potential role for cross-border mergers and acquisitions in keeping concentration low in the, uh, in the European Union because, you know, we know pretty much in the last 10 years, each time when, you know, uh, Germans trying to buy a firm, French scream. So this is, this is actually an important issue for Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let us collect some questions. So look. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's, um, it's rare to have a paper claiming that Europe is doing something better than the US. Uh, <laughs> and, um, that ma makes us immediately skeptical, right? But um, uh, so I like very much the way, Shepnam, you, you started your discussion because there are these two very important strands of the literature emerging. So is it really competition or technology? Um, there may be a way to link these two because what I found actually the most insightful parts of this of this literature is, is the rise of star firms. So you mentioned Google, but this is across industries in the US and this is definitely not happening in Europe. Um, and so even if it's that technology moves across borders, let's assume that. I mean, I think that can be contested as well. And this is then the big difference. And so. What I find quite alarming is that you have this growth of star firms in the US, but death rates have also collapsed. So there's a lot of entry and then super high growth. Obviously, if then death rates collapse as well, then 
concentration ratios will move. So maybe there's a way to link this technology literature, the, the rise of star firms to concentration and some of the things you look at in your paper to, to kind of link and hopefully separate these two stories. I wanted to have your reaction since you're much better informed, both of you, on this literature. Okay, I have the fourth row. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yes. Um, thank you. One comment and one question. Uh, the comment, um, I wonder actually whether you can look at it from the other way, uh, the other side, sorry, uh, talking about populism. Why is the EU so unpopular? We know, of course, there's a demand and a supply side to this populist wave. And the supply side, and I can look at this from, I'm, I'm looking at this mostly from the side of the UK and the, the, the Leave campaign, has been often supported by people who try to protect their, uh, their market share. So this kind of, um, maybe the realization that you can't lobby the EU as much as you can lobby and capture national governments uh, has is parts in there. And just to give you a quote with that, uh, Robert Murdoch was asked why he hates the uh, European Union, and he answers, well, if I go to Downing Street, they listen to me. If I go to Brussels, they don't even receive me. Um, so that might go in there. Then I have a question for, for Shepnam. Um, on the um, governance indicators, um, I wonder whether this is the right way to look at it, because it's, uh, for the EU, it is, a, it is a country average, right? And of course, it moves over time, and it, I think it's that uh, weighted by GDP. But of course, we also know that uh, certain countries grew much faster than others, partly due to convergence, like in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so I wonder uh, whether what this declining trend, for example, in control of corruption is actually driven really by the deterioration, or is it just driven that the countries that are more corrupt actually are also growing faster, not because uh, they were more corrupt, but because of the convergence process. Thanks. Okay. Yes, over there. Over there first, and then, and then Bernard. I'm sorry, and then over there. Yeah. No, in the back. OK. okay. okay. Sorry. On the back. <laughs> uh, trying to follow the order. Yeah. Okay, thank Sorry, you. Um, it's maybe more of a remark than a question. I think one, one element that I've been missing, um, which I think is an important um, fact of um, EU um, uh, law, is the whistleblower rule in, uh, in cases of price fixing. There have been an enormous um, a number of price fixings in the EU uh, that have gotten um, basically uh, looked at and the whistleblower rule is, is this is that the first company that comes forward uh, that says um, we've been doing price fixing uh, doesn't get the huge fines that the EU uh, gives and the other firms uh, suffer from that obviously and there have been enormous number of firms coming forward saying trying to be the first this has happened in the car industry this has ca happened in the washing powder industry this has happened in a lot of industries so I think that also keeps uh, markups low essentially by, um, by having this and I wonder I don't know in the US but I, I don't think this whistleblower rule is there in the US, but I think that's an institutional feature that's underestimated the power of this one. Okay. So, Bernard? Yes. Does, the, does this work? Yeah. Uh, great work. Um, since we're at the ECB, I want to ask a bit about monetary policy implications or relevance. The first point is the increase in competition coincides more or less with the introduction of the euro. So is there or could there be an effect from the single currency on top of the single market? Or could you try to distinguish what is due to the single market in the early 90s from maybe some uh, amplifying effect from price transparency through the single currency? Or is this all second order? Second point, you pointed to minus 6% in the markup since the early uh, 2000s. That's a big thing. Uh, does it affect the uh, optimal rate of inflation? So should there be a lower inflation target? Since this is probably something that is not in the control of the, of the monetary policy makers. Um, third point, like, look, what is the time profile of the effect of inflation? If we have these superstar firms like Amazon and now Tesla, they have a lot of losses initially, invest in market shares, and then they profit from the monopoly position later on. So you have very low inflation in the initial phase, but then you have much higher inflation later on. Is that something the bank should worry about? And the final suggestion is for the next paper. 
I suppose your work is mainly on non-financial corporates. Could you actually do the same thing for the financial sector? There's people in this building and elsewhere saying we need to concentrate and have big banks to be more profitable, which is a different angle than the Brussels uh, digi competition angle. It would be very helpful to have a work uh, uh, extended to that kind of question in the financial sector. Thank you. Okay, second row. So <clears throat> So I think, I think the nationality of the star firm is very important because, for instance, in corporate governance, we know that it is relatively easier to enforce the law against foreigners. So I am wondering at what extent the stronger level of enforcement of the competition authority in Europe is uh, driven by the fact that a lot of the formal actions are uh, against uh, foreign firms and uh, the star firms from the US in particular. Would be nice to see those numbers uh, without uh, the foreign cases. Okay, one last question. I, I, um, I really enjoyed this a lot. It was really a fascinating, fascinating paper. I had Two, two comments, one of which was that, and I'm speaking primarily from a, from a U.S. perspective, was that there's a huge amount of the U.S. economy that's regulated primarily at the hyper-local level rather than at the national level, right? And those have very different dynamics. So a third of consumer expenditures in housing. And there is some extent to which mergers of large construction companies are regulated at the, at, by the DOJ, but that is trivial relative to what hyper-local communities do in terms of, of regulating things. And those dynamics are quite different. Um, uh, and in, indeed, the usual story is, in fact, local capture by builders and banks actually promotes growth and promotes supply rather than the opposite. That, in fact, it ends up being that it, it, the, the counter to that is when homeowners actually capture the locality and then they block all new construction. But there are other areas, like retail, for example, where regulation is often done at the local level as well. So I would encourage you a lot to think about not just the EU-US differences at the, at the macro-regulatory level, but also at the micro-regulatory level, um, particularly in housing, but in other, in other sectors as well. And then the larger sort of very macro point that I, that I wanted to make is that when the AEA was founded 140-odd years ago or so, you know, it's clear that monopoly was the biggest thing on Francis Amaza Walker's mind, right? That, that this was the social loss that was driving things. And that was true throughout most of the next 60 or 70 years. But I would say for most of the 20 odd years in which I started in this profession, we sort of thought monopoly had become relatively unimportant and that we worried much more about externalities like, like carbon emissions. Have we reached a point in which monopoly should again be seen as, as being the primary or the second form of market failure that we worry about? And if so, would you be comfortable putting numbers down in terms of social losses that would make the case that relative to the pollution, congestion, whatever we think of the large Pugovian, classic Pugovian externalities that are out there, monopoly is actually a, a greater social, social harm? Okay. Thanks very much. So, Herman. Lots of questions. I'll, I'll touch one again. Um, so first, Chefnam, thank you very much. I think I agree that the point of, of contrasting technology and, and trying to learn by contrasting the different regions about whether technology is what's driving these trends is, is very important. I uh, should have emphasized more that. Um, in terms of markups, yeah, we, so we, we recently got firm level data. Um, part of what the reason, part of why we look at aggregates is that, that you know, we think that that sort of solve some of the issues of whether you do it at the firm level. It solves some of the measurement issues. Um, the fact that we don't see profits rising in Europe to us is fairly con convincing um, that you don't see it at the aggregate. Um, but nonetheless, I think we need to do a lot of work at, at, the, at the micro level. Um, we need to look at, at you know, the, the World Bank uh, and, and think more about uh, the evolution of indicators over time, so I agree with that. Uh, in terms of granular political capture, um, we're looking at that, so we're in the process of sort of merging lobbying data to the f at the US and EU level uh, to the firm level um, so that we can actually ask some of those more granular questions, um, but that, that takes some time. Um, in terms of sort of cross-border antitrust and, and M&A activity, so there is work that um, not for M&A, but for broader antitrust activity that shows that, in fact, you know, there doesn't seem to be a bias against foreign corporations. Um, once you look at the data, once you look at the fines and so on, there doesn't appear like Digicom has been penalizing foreign corporations more. Um, for M&A, I think that's, that's a different story, and it's a broader sort of question of, of 
capture at different levels than, than just Digicomp itself. Um, but I agree that that's an important point. Um, okay. In terms of sort of linking competition uh, and technology, um, I think that's part of what we're trying to understand, um, whether this is sort of a, a good or a bad trend. Um, of course, you know, if we have these superstar firms, we should expect technology to go up. Um, death rapes, you know, would rise at the beginning and then eventually fall if there's no entry, um, if sort of firms cannot compete. Um, there's the whole literature and sort of frontier firms getting further away that then could potentially depress entry. Um, and it could, in theory, you know, lead to rises in concentration. Um, I think what's important is, you know, understanding whether this is sort of beneficial or, or not. Um, and, you know, what is really limiting entry, whether it's the fact that these firms are super productive and they continue to invest a lot and get more productive over time, or if they sort of gotten to the point where they're far enough away and they've moved on to sort of protect their rent and erect more barriers to entry. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of the work that we have and what we looked at before was about investment. Um, where we find that, in fact, you don't see these leaders uh, invest a lot. You don't see these leaders sort of getting more productive. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of the relationships that you find from Otto are about, you know, concentration rising uh, with TFP. Um, they hold up until 2000, but then they break thereafter. Um, so we do have a bit more of a pessimistic view of recent years um, that, yes, you know, at some point this was because more productive firms were getting bigger. But you know that may be going away now, and, and we may be at a point that, that things are not so good. Um, to the point of populism, uh, I agree. I think that's sort of part of the point that you know delegating to the EU, um, you know, is a way in which you can sort of mitigate this influence from, from local governments and, and, and local um, elites. Um, let's see, monetary policy. I think there's a lot more work to be done on that. Uh, I think we we haven't thought enough. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, last, in terms of local regulation, yeah, absolutely agree. I think, you know, occupational licensing, uh, all those subjects are, are very important. Um, we have another project trying to look at, at, at state level regulation uh, and, and, and study, you know, its effect on entry, uh, which is sort of to the point of, of, you know, what does it mean for barriers to entry? And is it that, you know, incumbents that lobby more um, then depress the level of entry uh, into their industries? Um, so, yeah, a lot to do. <laughs> um. Um, just uh, to answer the question, I, I totally agree. You know, they have to do it by country by country, too. This is what exactly I work on right now. But their existing uh, figures done the GDP weights. So I just plotted different indicators also doing the GDP weights. But that's important. So um, let me say one thing. Um, but, I forgot to say this, and I didn't have time uh, to put in my slides. Uh, but when Ed asked this question, I uh, just Remember that I saw this paper this week. There's a new paper by uh, Esteban Rosse Hansberg and co authors on local versus national concentration in the US. And it's very interesting, actually. They show this increased concentration in the US, as the other papers, as uh, work by Horman and Tama, but they also show local level, it is decreasing and it promotes actually growth and investment. So, local defined uh, more like in the antitrust IO way. So, it is actually, uh, I think, very important. And um, the monetary policy and finance question, uh, we actually look at this finance sector. Finance is the only sector in Europe that concentration increased actually from 1999 to 2012. But this literature is really focused on non financial, but the finance would be on the other side. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So we stop now for a coffee break and we're back at 20 past 10. Thank you. Thank you.